All right, welcome to the show, everybody. So, of course, I have a million Israel and Gaza updates for you. We have some hostages that have been released. We have, honestly, some violations of the ceasefire, and I don't see that getting nearly as much coverage as it deserves. We have widespread protests continuing. We have now the idea of using U.S. troops is being floated. So we'll get to all that. There's a million things to break down. We also have the Pope goes after the IDF. That's interesting. We have a giant media fail where they described a car crash as terrorism. I'll explain to you why that is. It's like they wanted to rush to judgment, honestly, to fulfill the narrative that uh, is most juicy at the moment. That's a weird way to describe it, but I think you know what I'm saying. We also have horrible Biden polls and Dean Phillips, who announced his run for president about three and a half minutes ago. He's already flailing and failing massively. So we'll talk about all that and much, much more. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into it here. And everybody do me a big favor. Please subscribe to the channel. Oh, by the way, I should bring this up. We were ahead of my lovely and beautiful wife for the history of this channel. And I told you guys that Breaking Points was nipping at my heels in terms of subscriber count. And I regret to inform you that now Breaking Points has eclipsed Secular Talk in subs. Now, of course, massive congratulations to my lovely, gorgeous, beautiful wife. But at the same time, do I want to win the subscriber war? You bet your ass I do. So everybody, hook a brother up, if for nothing else, just a sympathy sub, right? Like, just <laughs> try to get me back in the lead, just out of pure pity, if nothing else. So anyway, they uh, they surpassed me the other day. They had a Norman Finkelstein interview that went absolutely bananas. And so now I'm behind probably like two or 3,000 subscribers already. So hook a brother up with a sub. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. I have to get back in the lead. I have to catch them. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and dive into it here. A lot of news coming out of Israel and Gaza. Let's start with this here in CNBC. Israel confirms 17 hostages released, including four-year-old American girl. The Israeli Prime Minister's Office confirmed that 17 additional hostages were released on Sunday, the third day of the four-day military pause between Hamas and Israel. The newly released individuals bring the total number of freed hostages to 41. Per the terms of the Israel-Hamas Israel agreement, Israel said it would extend the pause in fighting beyond four days if Hamas agrees to release additional hostages. So here they have a, a list of the hostages, their names, their ages. So just to give you a sense of who was released, we knew it was mostly going to be women and children in these batches, but apparently it also includes some people who are up there in age as well. So there was a four-year-old girl who was released, 84-year-old was released, 62, 25, 40, 10 years old, 8 years old, 4 years old, 48, 17. So here's the list of the people who were released. Um, now, on the flip side of the equation, I'm going to give you those numbers as well. They say 50 Hamas hostages are due to be freed over four days, over the four days under the terms of an agreement between Israel and Hamas. In the first two days of the temporary ceasefire, 24 hostages were released from Gaza in exchange for 39 Palestinian prisoners. So that's uh, what was released on the other side. Now, I should uh, point out that this article came out yesterday, so the numbers might be updated a little bit since then. Let me also give you this. So there are claims coming from Hamas that even though this uh, hostage deal is happening and, you know, people are being released, at the same time, there are some potential violations. So I'll give you what the Hamas officials say, and then I'll also give you what's not necessarily a claim from the Hamas officials, but what there's independent news agency verified evidence of violations of the ceasefire as well. So... Hamas official accuses Israel of violating terms of hostage deal. This is in the Times of Israel. A senior advisor to Hamas leader abroad, Ismail Haniyeh, claims Israel violated the terms of the temporary ceasefire in a statement made hours before an apparent delay in the release of the second batch of the hostages. Tahir Al-Nono tells Al Jazeera that Israel did not comply with clauses regarding the entry of humanitarian aid trucks into Gaza, particularly regarding the distribution of aid in the Northern Strip, where the fighting has been most intense. However, Israel has allowed 200 trucks into the Strip, as required by the deal, and Israel's COGAT, Kogat military liaison to the Palestinians, announced earlier that 50 of those trucks reached northern Gaza. Uh, Nono also claims that Israel also didn't adhere to terms regarding the release of the Palestinian prisoners, which Hamas had pushed to be freed in a different order than what Israel carried out. The Walla news site, citing an anonymous source familiar with the details of the negotiations, reports that Hamas claims 
that the order under which Israel was supposed to release the Palestinian prisoners was based on length of imprisonment, with those jailed the longest to be released first. However, this was not the order by which the prisoners were released by Israel on Thursday. The senior Hamas official claims the IDF violated the deal by firing at Gazans who had been seeking to return to northern Gaza in what led to the deaths of two Palestinians. Israel asserts that a clause of the deal included one, barring Palestinians from returning to northern Gaza, where the IDF is still operating. So, on that front, we actually have BBC verification later on. I'll get to that uh, video for you. But Hamas is claiming, apart from releasing the hostages not in the proper order, that also Israel is violating the ceasefire by shooting at Palestinians who are trying to get back to their homes in northern Gaza. Now, why are they trying to get there? I don't know. Are they trying to get there and stay there? I doubt it. It's totally destroyed. Are they trying to get there to get some of their belongings from their houses insofar as they can? Uh, that is probably the scenario. But even though we hit these snags, there was a delay in the release of one batch of the prisoners but then it appears like um, everything sort of went back to normal. Okay. Now, remember, I should also point out, this is super important, that Israel says as soon as the ceasefire is over, we're going to get right back to leveling Gaza. They made no ifs, ands, or buts about it. In fact, there was even one report that they said we're going to step up the bombing after this ceasefire is through. Okay. Let's continue. So this is from Jeremy Scahill of The Intercept. The list of Palestinians to be potentially released by Israel has 300 names. 270 children out of 300, 270 children, 30 women, 233 have not been convicted of anything. So these are just flat out political prisoners, no due process. 21 are accused of throwing stones. So that was their great crime, which led them to be locked up indefinitely. All right, more from The Intercept. More than two-thirds of the Palestinians proposed for release by Israel under the truce have not been convicted of any crimes. Most were arrested as children. So again, I should point out, everybody's been talking about, rightfully so, the over 200 um, political prisoners that Hamas took. Again, understandably so. That makes perfect sense. These people are innocent. They shouldn't be held as hostages in any way, shape, or form. At the same time, Nobody talks about the thousands of innocent Palestinian political prisoners held by Israel. That very rarely gets brought up. But obviously, in the course of the, these negotiations behind the scenes, Hamas was demanding that we need stronger terms to agree to a ceasefire, and one of those things has to be the release of our own hostages slash political prisoners. And again, they agreed to, to terms the other day, and we went over the details of it. So, this is really interesting. I'm going to show you an MSNBC report. And, you know, every now and then you get these truth bombs that, that are dropped on mainstream media in the U.S. And, of course, they go viral because people are so used to hearing a very biased, one-sided story in Western media. Listen to this. Yeah, no, you're telling me that 150 of the people that are going to be released in exchange have not had any judicial oversight, have never been dealt with through the Israeli judicial system? Many of them, indeed. Uh, there is a system inside Israel that's called administrative detention. And what it is is that a person can be picked up and held without charge, without trial, um, for as much as six months, and their detention renewed every six months indefinitely. Many of the people who we've seen on the list, and they have been releasing these lists, are people who are in these conditions as well. I think it's very important for us to recognize that, that unfortunately, the only system that has worked in order to get people to be released is international pressure. And there has been no international pressure brought to bear on Israel for all of these years that it's maintained this military occupation. So I got to give you an update on the numbers as well here. So again, this is from Euromed Monitor, a human rights group that's in the region. I should be clear that according to the UN, these numbers are still lower. There appears to be what I think is a lag in the UN numbers. I don't know if it's because they don't have as many personnel on the ground as they need. I, you know, you guys know a lot of UN people were killed in the Israeli bombing. So has that affected their count, their ability to gather information? Potentially. I don't know for sure. This is all speculation. But Euromed Monitor has had figures which I think ultimately will prove to be more accurate. So look at this. We have now crossed the 20,000 killed number in Gaza. Of those, 8,176 are children. So in other words, almost half of the killed in Gaza are children. This includes 4,112 women. And get this, man. So of the 20,031 people killed, 
a total of 18,460 are innocent civilians. So again, we're talking about over 90% innocent civilians. Add on top of this, 36,350 injuries. Now the number of journalists who have been killed is all the way up to 67. By the way, like, how many journalists are there even in Gaza? How many journalists are there? I mean, my guess is they probably took out more than half of the journalists that are in Gaza. We have displaced people. 1.7 million are displaced. And remember, the population is about 2.3 million in all of Gaza. So this is the overwhelming majority of Gaza that's displaced, that have lost their homes. Uh, completely destroyed housing units, 59,240 partially destroyed units. Are you kidding me? 165,300. Destroyed and damaged press headquarters, 140. Damaged schools, 266 schools have been bombed, either directly hit or some indirectly hit. Destroyed industrial facilities, 1,040. So that's like factories, places of employment. Damaged mosques, 91. Damaged churches, 3. Targeted health staff, 446. Nurses, doctors, paramedics have been targeted, and there's been a total of 210 of them killed. 236 of them injured. And then we get targeted health facilities. Again, I go back to that conversation. Remember when the Al-Ali hospital was bombed and everybody was debating online? Hey, was it a misfired Islamic Jihad slash Hamas rocket or was it the IDF that did it? Well, even if I grant you that that bombing was not the IDF, what about the other 124 health facilities? Now, Occam's Razor is the people who fired in thousands and thousands of rockets are the ones hitting the infrastructure. So, by the way, in total, it is 22 hospitals that have been targeted. 55 clinics and 46 ambulances. So, again, I want to stress this point, guys. We've never seen anything like this, certainly in my lifetime. I'm 35 years old. I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime. All of the death and destruction and the horror with the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan, it was abysmal. But in such a short time span, this has far surpassed the, the death and carnage of those wars in relative to the same time frame. I mean, this is out of this world. Again, we've never seen anything like this in our lifetimes. So then we have this. I'm going to show you a video here. Um, this is the al qassam Brigades, which is the military arm of Hamas. They are the ones who are releasing Israeli political prisoners here, and I want to show you some of the video of it. Let's watch. She will translate for me. Bye now. Goodbye. 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 Welcome. Welcome. Come on. Come on. A lot of those people were Thai. A bunch of the Thai prisoners were released. I can't imagine what that feels like. First of all, I can't imagine what it's like to be taken as a hostage. But then I definitely can't imagine what it would be like to then be released. So, I mean, this is, again, scenes the likes of which we've never seen before. Okay, so now I'm going to show you, this is uh, the first moments after some of the hostages were released. These are the hostages that were being held in Israel, the political prisoners, uh, when they were released and they reunited with their families. I'm going to show you this video as well. This is wild. <laughs> فتيان فتيان وصل الى بيتهم في الضفه الغربيه او في القدس بالتحديد في القدس just totally and utterly overjoyed to see their family members all right so now uh, i mentioned before that there were reports that israel had violated the ceasefire they claim hey we didn't violate the ceasefire because part of the agreement was still that you can't go back to north gaza and some individual palestinians wanted to go back to north gaza probably to get stuff out of their homes which are now almost all destroyed um but with these palestinians who were trying to go back to north gaza they were fired upon by the idf watch this <laughs> 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 
More worryingly, we're also hearing that despite an Israeli order for people who are displaced not to head back from the south of the Gaza Strip to their homes in the north, some people have been trying to do so. Uh, they've broken off trying to use side roads, and we're hearing that several people have been wounded by Israeli ground forces opening fire. We're more worryingly, we're... So this was the BBC reporting it in real time. Uh, again, we had a snag where I think it was the second batch of uh, hostages to be released. Hamas paused that and did not release them on the agreed upon time frame because they claimed, hey, Israel violated the ceasefire. But eventually that batch was released. So everything appears to be back on track now uh, insofar as the deal is concerned. So warning here, uh, this, and I should have said that before. I didn't know that this was the next tab, but this is one of the mass graves that were buried for all of the tremendous number of casualties that Gaza is currently piling up. Yeah, I'll warn you one more time, I'm going to show you this video of, of them uh, putting these bodies in the mass grave. I, and the reason, guys, I should be clear, the reason why I'm showing this to you is because you have to understand, this isn't abstract. This, like, I give you the numbers every time we do one of these segments, but this isn't just abstract. These are real people with real stories, real families, real lives. Somebody's world is shattered every single time one of these innocent civilians gets killed. But we're not talking about one. We're talking about over 18,000 of them. Now, there were also reports the other day that when they were building these mass graves, the IDF was firing upon the personnel who were doing that. So it was very difficult for health staff to even dig the graves and put the bodies in because they were risking their lives in the process of trying to do it. So this is really, really astonishing stuff. Again, warning, but we're going to watch a little bit. And look, there's a question, how many times has this been done since the Israeli bombardment started? How many mass graves are there now throughout Gaza? 18,000 innocent civilians. All right. So now we get to this. This was uh, in The Intercept, reported by Ken Klippenstein. Joe Biden moves to lift nearly every restriction on Israel's access to U.S. weapons stockpile. Every restriction. Now, remember, there was a State Department official who resigned the other day, and he said, look, the reason I'm resigning is because my job is to make sure that these weapons get in the right hands and we have sort of a tracking process so we know where it's going and it's reasonable and it's orderly. And this guy came out and said, when you, even when you talk about arming Saudi Arabia, there are rules and regulations that are in place, and we make sure the proper process is followed. He said, when it comes to Israel, my higher-ups say to me, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to track where every single bullet and gun and uh, and uh, armored vehicle goes. You don't have to track any of that stuff. Shut up and just pass it off. And this guy said, look, I saw what was going on in Gaza. I saw all the innocent civilian deaths. And I said, I can't be a part of this. I can't be a part of this. This is crazy. And so dude resigned. And then he went and did a whole bunch of interviews with the media. Well, now we're learning whatever lax rules and regulations are there in the first place, they're saying... What, whatever rules remain, forget those two. Forget those two. And again, it's not like Joe Biden doesn't know what's going on in Gaza. And in the midst of all of that, he's like, yeah, let's uh, continue to arm Israel to the teeth and ask no questions. So then we have this. At the same time that we have this ceasefire with Gaza and we have this hostage deal where people are being released, at the exact same time, we have Israel stepping up hostilities in the West Bank. And in fact, there's some reporting that for the exact number of hostages of, of Palestinian political prisoners that have been released by Israel, they've taken the same number from the West Bank, new political prisoners. So here's a video of Israeli forces breaking these like security cameras during a raid into the Janine refugee camp in the West Bank. So you can see there, it looks like they're beating the, uh, the camera with the butt of a gun or a shovel or something like that. All right. So, it, I mean, look, it's, this is why we know Joe Biden 
and the U.S. government have to rein in the Israeli government. Because how can you, you know, negotiate in good faith with Gaza and release political prisoners, but then go and take the exact same number of political prisoners from the West Bank? And remember, guys, Hamas doesn't run the West Bank. So this notion that, hey, we're just targeting Hamas, we're just trying to er eradicate Hamas. Well, the evidence shows you're not doing that. O you know, over 90% innocent civilian deaths and also uh, stepping up hostilities in the West Bank. Clearly, this is not about Hamas. So then we have this. Tom Cotton went on uh, U.S. media and says, hey, it is on the table to send U.S. troops to Gaza. He explains that, like, yeah, we still have some American political prisoners, and uh, U.S. special forces should potentially be used, boots on the ground, in Gaza, to, to try to get those political prisoners. I mean, how do, how do you even respond to that, right? So, okay, we deploy U.S. special forces. What happens if they get shot? What happens if they get killed? Would Tom Cotton then say, you know what, now I want a full-scale invasion of Gaza, I want the U.S. to be directly involved in that? Also, there's negotiations that are ongoing with Hamas, and there has been a hostage deal where prisoners have been released. Why would you not use traditional diplomatic uh, negotiation procedures in order to try to uh, guarantee the release of all the American hostages? Cl clearly, it's possible. Clearly, there are terms that are agreeable enough where you could get this done. But to Tom Cotton, any excuse whatsoever to try to get more U.S. boots on the ground, to try to get the U.S. more involved in a conflict, He's willing to take it. So he's saying the U.S., we've already co-signed the war crimes and the atrocities and the violations of international law by the Israeli government. He wants us more directly involved. Remember, he's a neocon's neocon. This is a guy who, I remember the, the first time we started covering him on this show is when he provided this, like, fawning over-the-top defense of why torture is a glorious and wonderful thing that we should use by any means necessary in all of our, you know, in the war on terror and all of our Middle Eastern conflicts. This guy is the biggest Abu Ghraib defender, Guantanamo Bay defender, and he's never met a country he didn't want to invade. He's the neocon's neocon. All right, let's also get to this. This is a wild story, man. Now, many people have pointed out, I'm not the first one to point out, that Israel appears to be horrifically losing the propaganda war. Um, they're releasing some really wacky stuff since the beginning of this conflict, and people are, like, seeing right through it. And by the way, this is probably one of the reasons why the younger generation is uh, beginning to form some pretty strong opinions on this conflict. But they, this is insane, they decided, let's buy the URL Hamas.com, and let's turn it into, let's pretend like it's an actual Hamas website, and let's display all of the, like, horrific, brutal terror attacks, and and put it up there like we're proud of it and we want the world to see it. But they did such a sad, sloppy job, and they left so much evidence in their wake that now everybody knows this is the Israeli government pretending to be Hamas to try to build a, a stronger propaganda narrative against them. So here in Haaretz, they say, Israelis hijacked, hijacked Hamas.com, turning it into a display of October 7th atrocities. A counter on the site proudly declares 1,400 Zionist civilians murdered. By the way, that's actually not the numbers. The numbers 1,200 Israelis killed, but about 55% of them are military targets, 45% of them are innocent civilians. That's according to Israel's own numbers that they released earlier on. Um, 41 Zionist children and babies murdered and burnt alive. This is what they put on the website. The website does not appear to be linked to Hamas, whose actual website, Hamas.ps, currently appears to be offline. So I'll give you... Some more on this here. So this is the sort of stuff that they pushed, that they uh, put on the website. Young Jewish girl kidnapped to Gaza after being raped and beaten by Hamas. Our forces imprison young infidel couple at the music festival. Our Hamas warriors brutally assault and kidnap youngsters from a party into Gaza. Young Jewish girl punished and taken to Gaza. This is the stuff that they put up. But guess what? Not only is the website registered with an Israeli company, which was sort of a dead giveaway that this is... <laughs> the the Israeli government doing it, pretending it's Hamas, but also, it gives you a, a virus. It gives you a virus. It's like a malicious site. Jesus Christ, man, their propaganda game is so weak. All right, now I'm going to show you something else that went viral over the weekend. So this is uh, from an, an Israeli news channel. 
and they talk to these female soldiers. They're trying to do like this girl boss type segment where it's like, look at these female badasses handling Hamas terrorists. And so these, uh, these female soldiers tell their story and, but there's moments that are, that are in this report, which probably in retrospect, the Israeli government does not want this out there. And Israeli media does not want this out there because it actually verifies what a lot of the critics have been saying all along. So, uh, one of the parts of it is quote, are there civilians inside quote? This is, uh, one of the female soldiers higher ups says to her quote, I don't know. Just shoot. The question was, are there civilians inside? And the higher-up says, I don't know, just shoot. Which, again, verifies what many people were saying, that a lot of innocent Israelis were killed when the IDF showed up and tried to take out Hamas, but was indiscriminately firing in the process. So I'll play this for you. It's in Hebrew, so we're not, you're not going to be able to understand it, or at least most of you aren't. <laughs> ומתחילים לדהור לכיוון ההכוונות עם, ה... עם הכוונות ידיים של אותו חייל, והוא מצביע לילטור ואומר לי, תראי לשם פגז, יש שם מחבלים. אני שואלת אותו בחזרה, יש שם אזרחים? הוא אומר לי, לא יודע, תראי לשם פגז. אני מחליטה לא לראות שם לשם פגז, אנחנו מדברים על יישוב ישראלי. אני יורה אש מקלעים לכניסה של הבית. So, to give credit to this soldier, she says, I'm not going to indiscriminately shell them with the big weapons because you just said you don't know if there's civilians in there. So she takes out her machine gun and tries to be a little more targeted. So, I mean, this is why, again, they published this. That you had the higher-ups. Now, how many people got that order and just listened? And didn't wait and say, hold on, I'm, not, I'm trying not to target civilians here. Absolutely wild stuff. Okay, so then we have this guy. Oh my God, this argument drives me crazy. And I'm sure all of you have heard this since the beginning of the conflict. But you have an Israeli official went on BBC and said, what Hamas is committing is worse than what the Nazis did. I've now heard this a million times where people try to downplay the atrocities of the Nazis and play up the atrocities of Hamas. First of all, you don't need to, to tweak it in any direction whatsoever. Hamas killing innocent civilians is disgusting and brutal and grotesque. And that doesn't require any uh, propaganda spin on it, right? And by the same token, what the Nazis did in no way, shape, or form should anybody ever say, you know, the Nazis were horrible, but, but what? But what? No, th this idea that Hamas is worse. And the argument goes something like this. Well, Hamas wanted everybody to see their insane brutality. They were proud of it. They recorded it. Whereas the Nazis, they were clearly somewhat ashamed because they tried to hide their atrocities because they didn't want the world to see it. First of all, I would probably argue over whether or not that's factually accurate in the first place, this idea that, you know, the Nazis were desperately trying to hide what they were doing. To the extent they were, it was probably because they didn't want to unite the world in opposition to them, making it less of a chance that they would win, because a, a united, strong opposition with way higher numbers would probably be difficult to defeat. But I don't think in any way, shape, or form the Nazis were ashamed of what they were doing. In fact, it was like they were uh, proud about what they were doing because their ideology proclaimed, we want to create a superior Aryan race, and we want to get rid of these, they would describe as parasites and vermin. They want to get rid of uh, Jews. They want to eradicate them to protect the bloodline. It was totally, like, junk science, eugenics-based, and it, they were deeply, deeply ideological with what they were doing, okay? But, look, a good reaction to this is as follows. What about, like, there's been horrifically brutal slave rebellions throughout history where they do the most unimaginable things you can think of. Well, if it's unimaginable, you literally can't think of it, but you get the point I'm trying to make. And like, they would kill innocent civilians, the children of their masters, the mother and, and father of their masters, really old people, and they would, uh, you know, display it to the world, right? Or at least in so far as you could do it at the time. Obviously, there weren't video cameras at the time, right? But... So, you could have a slave rebellion that is brutal and barbaric and kills innocent civilians, and they show it off. Does that make the slaves who were rebelling worse than the Nazis? Because the Nazis maybe, maybe not tried to hide the extent of their atrocities? No, obviously not. Look, bottom line is this. Killing civilians, in my opinion, is always wrong. Purposefully targeting innocent civilians is the definition of terrorism, no matter who does it. So, when... Hamas purposely targets innocent civilians uh, in Israel. 
it's as condemnable as possible, and it is terrorism. And when the Nazis do it, same thing. And also when the IDF does it, purposely targets uh, innocent Palestinian civilians, same thing. So I just don't buy... It's just li like... It comes across as they're downplaying the Nazi atrocities. Uh, and it comes across as trying to justify and rationalize literally anything we do against the Palestinians is justified because Hamas is just that bad. So if we happen to go after innocent civilians on the Palestinian side, we should get a pass because Hamas is so bad that they're actually worse than the Nazis. This is why they make arguments like this. Okay, let's continue. So Jewish Voice for Peace, um, they have been very, very busy recently, man. They've been protesting anywhere and everywhere. These are very uh, strategic moves. So what happened this weekend is they shut down the Manhattan Bridge on the busiest travel day of the year, and they refused to leave until Biden called for a permanent ceasefire. Now, I don't have the update on this. I don't know how long they were able to hold the bridge, um, but understand that this is something that's been going on across the country. We've seen so many examples of peop young people more mobilized and organized than I've maybe ever seen them before. I think we've surpassed the amount of passion and, and vigor that we saw even during the anti-Iraq war protests in the early days. So, and I do have more examples of that coming for you here. Uh, so Joe Biden was on vacation and protesters started shouting genocide at him when he was watching some sort of, you know, festival or show in the street. And they were loud and they were aggressive and they were basically calling him uh, Genocide Joe. So, I, look, I, I have to admit, I like that these politicians who are helping to facilitate this slaughter can't go anywhere in public without being shamed. I'm, of course, on the side 100% nonviolent. Don't put your hands on anybody. You know, don't threaten anybody. But to protest and to express disapproval and to shame, I'm 100% on that side because, you know, hey, we're, we're starting to, to move the line a little bit here. Right? We're starting to get through to them a little bit here, and I have more evidence of that coming up in just a second. So we also had the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York City. Um, a bunch of protesters tried to shut that down to try to uh, say, hey, we need a ceasefire. We got to stop this. So we'll, let's watch some of this. Free Palestine! Free! 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 So look, my general rule of thumb is that I prefer it when protesters target the people with the actual power making the actual decisions. So I would prefer, you know, sit-ins at, at uh, the Senate or the House of Representatives or around the White House or around Biden's house or whatever. Like now you have Israeli protesters now going to Netanyahu's house in Israel. So like that's what I prefer. Uh, I like to be very specific and targeted with not only where you protest and how you protest, but your demands as well. But having said that, the need for this particular issue, the need is so dire that we're witnessing a slaughter right in front of our eyes, witnessing effectively a genocide or an ethnic cleansing or both right in front of our eyes, that this sort of like scattershot approach of just to get bodies everywhere, disrupt everything to try to uh, force a, a peaceful resolution here. You can't help but support it. In fact, in my opinion, the best thing I've seen to this point is when you had protesters trying to block these ships that had weapons that were bound for Israel to be used in the slaughter. Protesters tried to block those ships. That is the exact kind of protest that I think is phenomenal. And then we get to this. This is gonna. This is like a legendary picture, man. So this is uh, the Minions float during the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And you can see people protesting, got the Palestine flag. Genocide then, genocide now. Wow. This encapsulates so much in one little picture, right? You have, like, the frivolous nature of, uh, you know, American pop culture mixed in with the seriousness of an ongoing slaughter, and those two worlds collide. All right, so look at this one. U.S. Jews attempt to trademark from the river to the sea Palestinian chant. So, you have a couple, like, Jewish businessmen who 
in their estimation, they say, hey, from the river to the sea is always an anti-Semitic uh, chant. It's always a call for genocide. This is what they would claim. Um, and so they decided, well, let's be kind of clever here and crafty here and try to trademark that chant so that, in other words, that would make it so that nobody could sell shirts or hats or any sort of apparel that says from the river to the sea. Now, they registered to try to get the trademark, but look, my guess is it's going to get slapped down. I don't think they're actually going to be able to get it, but just the fact that they're trying to do it is clearly an attempt to stifle pro-Palestine free speech. And by the way, let's be clear, it's not true that From the River to the Sea is always anti-Semitic or always genocidal. I will grant you that when Hamas says From the River to the Sea, they quite literally mean we want there just to be uh, a Palestine, no Israel, and also either, you know, expel the Israel, the, the Israelis out of Israel and or kill them. I grant you that that's what Hamas means. But now you have a lot of young left-wing activists and other pro-Palestine activists who say from the river to the sea, and what they mean when they say that is one state in the region where everybody lives in peace, and the occupation and the apartheid. Some people would say, call it Israel. Some people would say, call it Palestine. Some people would say, make it binational. Call it Israel-Palestine or Palestine-Israel, and have one state, uh, secular democracy, democratic rights for all. That is absolutely not the same thing as Hamas's call for effectively a genocide. It's not the same thing. So don't you can't say from the river to the sea is always anti-Semitic and always genocidal and always violent. That is 100% untrue. In fact, in the context of people saying it in the U.S., it is almost never anti-Semitic or genocidal. Most people, when they say it in the U.S., they mean end the occupation, end the apartheid, one state democratic rights for all. So you can lie and smear and say, no, that's genocidal, but that's just not true when you say it. All right, then we get this. So I told you that the pressure was uh, sort of getting to the powerful, okay? This is really interesting. White House, in readout of Biden call with Egypt Sisi, that's the leader of Egypt, says the U.S. won't permit under any circumstances a forced expulsion of Palestinians from the West Bank or Gaza or redrawing of Gaza's borders. So this is Biden telling the rest of the world, and Egypt, who of course is Israel's neighbor, look, we're not going to allow Israel to annex Gaza. We're not going to allow them to permanently, um, you know, kick out Palestinians from their own land. We're not going to have another Nakba. This is what he's saying. Now, is that true? Well, I mean, North Gaza is already totally destroyed, and people were forced to leave their homes there. People, uh, Palestinians were forced to go into South Gaza. So, it looks like it's already not true, right? Unless, uh, you know, Biden has said on, you absolutely have to allow these people to return, you have to rebuild, etc. Uh, but this is, honestly, my thought was, Biden had already conceded behind the scenes to, it is what it is, and Israel's going to do what they're going to do. And if they want to take, at the very least, North Gaza, they're going to. And if they want to take all of Gaza, they're going to. My sense was Biden was already kind of resigned to that. But this tells me that he is actually not resigned to that. And if anything, it shows the extreme naivete of Biden. That, like, he's been making this argument to the world of, like, oh, yeah, getting rid of Hamas. They're, you know, they should try to follow humanitarian law, etc. This is defensive. He's been making that case. While internally, Israeli officials have been like, let's do the new Nakba. You know, let's uh, get rid of the Palestinians, force them to go to the rest of the world. Voluntary emigration. So uh, people floating, dropping nukes on God. You have, so the Israeli officials internally are being consistent and barbaric, and Biden tried to put this humanitarian smiley face on it. But this is him saying to Sisi behind the scenes, look, I'm not on board with ethnically cleansing Gaza. I'm not on board with Israel taking permanent control of Gaza. And so... Look, that's a good thing, but are you all all bark or do you have some bite? Because, look, if Biden is not going to force Israel, then he should just shut up. It's one thing to say this, but are your actions going to force Israel? Now you're continuing to arm them to the teeth, so it doesn't look like you're going to back it up. But he should back it up, and we should force him to back up these claims here, that we're not going to let them do that. Okay, cut off their weapons, condemn them, allow a condemnation through with the United Nations. There's a million things you can do. 
Remember, in theory, all it takes is one phone call. Ronald Reagan made one phone call. Israel stopped the bombing of Lebanon. George W. Bush conditioned a, ten, conditioned a $10 billion loan guarantee to Israel, and they immediately stopped expanding settlements. According to some reporting in 2021, Biden made one phone call and said, I'm out of runaway here. You got to stop the bombing. And then Yahoo stopped the bombing. So if you are committed, if, you're, if this is true, Joe, your actions need to back it up. Don't just say it to CeCe. Your actions have to back up. Like, okay. Okay, no more. They're not, Israel's not going to redraw the borders here. All right, let's continue. So this is interesting. So uh, according to the Washington Post, there are internal divisions in the White House about Gaza and Israel. And they report that this happened the day after Biden questioned the Gaza casualty figures. I'm going to uh, quote from the piece here. The following day, Biden met with five prominent Muslim Americans who protested what they saw as his insensitivity to the civilians who were dying. All spoke of people they knew who had been affected by the suffering in Gaza, including a woman who had lost 100 members of her family. Biden appeared to be affected by their account. Quote, I'm sorry. I'm disappointed in myself, he told the group, according to two people familiar with, familiar with the meeting. I will do better. The meeting scheduled for 30 minutes ended up lasting more than an hour, according to one White House official, and ended with Biden hugging one of the participants. So this is when people are, are confronting him with the reality that his words were wrong. When he said, oh, I don't trust those numbers coming out of the Gaza Health Ministry. Really? Well, they were accurate in the last multiple conflicts. So why would you not trust it now? And he meets with people who, hey, I have family members who were killed in the Israeli bombardment. He backs down. But again, I want to reiterate this. Uh, this is good. This is better than if it didn't happen, right? But your actions have to back it up, Joe. Your actions have to back it up. But again, I'm seeing more movement than I've seen before on this issue. And like just the fact that we got, uh, you know, a pause in the fighting and we got some semblance of a hostage deal, that should give a little bit of an inkling of hope that there is going to be maybe a little more pressure from the West than there was otherwise, when it was just a total green light at the very beginning. All right, and then we'll end with this. This is wild, man. On November 9th, Israeli police arrested history and civics teacher Meir Baruchin after he posted on Facebook about his opposition to the killing of innocent Palestinian civilians. Baruchin has been released from jail but still faces charges. He details his ordeal here, so we're not going to play it, but he talks about this um, at length. And this is where we're at total authoritarianism now in Israel where you can't even, can't even express sympathy for innocent Palestinians who've been killed. So this is wild. What we're witnessing is wild. And so here's what you take away from this really long segment, which is way too long now. Uh, it's good that we have a hostage deal. It's good that people are being released. Israel should stop the, uh, the little violations of the ceasefire agreement around the edges. They should absolutely stop that. And also they should not go back to wantonly bombing, which is what they say they're going to do when this pause is up. So it's good that we got this deal, but bottom line, all this talk now from the West where there's a little bit of a break from Israel, Biden needs to back it up with his actions. It can't just be talk. And by the way, credit to all of the protesters out there in the streets, because if it wasn't for you guys, I don't even think there would be this talk now of a different path from the Biden administration. It wouldn't even be the talk. It would still be the total green light. Now, right now, there's talk in a more positive direction, but it's still functionally and policy-wise a green light. Keep the pressure on so that it no longer is that. Because the fact of the matter is this. Biden sees the numbers. He knows he's hemorrhaging Arab Americans and Muslim Americans. He knows he's hemorrhaging young, young Americans. You need to convince them that this is more detrimental to you than crossing the Israel lobby. Because right now, they still feel like, oh my God, crossing the Israel lobby would be a bigger political faux pas. Wrong. They need to feel, no, you need to cross the Israel lobby. Uh, because if you don't, you're going to get destroyed in your next election. So, all right. That's all the updates for you now. I'll keep my eye on it. And the next time, I'm sure we'll have another 40-some-odd-minute segment giving you all the updates. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop, and watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.